when the dogs and gators meet annually in Jacksonville, you can go ahead and throw out those record books. Although Georgia is chasing big picture college football immortality, trying to become the first team to three-peat in the modern era, this is still a conference known for its regional rivalries. And they don't get much more intense than this. And while this year's matchup may seem a bit one-sided, never underestimate the power of motivation. You know, this is uh, one of those games that you, as a competitor, you look forward to being a part of. Many have tried to come at the Kings, but it's their razor focus that has kept them at the peak of the college football mountaintop. This one's unique because of where it's played. Uh, it'll be a new experience for some of our guys. It's the dogs and gators for the 102nd time, and it's always personal. Georgia looking to become just the second program ever to win 25 straight games in SEC history. But can Florida play the spoiler? Jordan Hill and Jacob Rudner here to break down the SEC game of the week on CBS. The Bulldogs favored by just over two touchdowns in the annual trip to Jacksonville for the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. They've won two in a row and five of the last six in this series. But Georgia playing its first game without the all-star tight end Brock Bowers, who recently underwent a procedure for a high ankle sprain, second all-time on the list for receiving touchdowns at Georgia. Great in the clutch, do-it-all type of guy. Jordan, what kind of impact does his absence have? Well, it's going to be huge, and it's kind of weird to uh, be walking in a situation where you have questions about a Georgia offense that's averaging just over 40 points per game, but they don't have Brock Bowers. And, you know, we may see Brock on the sideline in Jacksonville. I asked Kirby Smart about that on Wednesday. Uh, he said they haven't made the decision yet if he will travel. He's not, obviously not going to be able to play in this game either way. Uh, they've got to figure out how they're going to play without him. Uh, he was something of a security blanket to Carson Beck, uh, who by all means had done a good job of passing the ball around to other guys. Uh, but when in, uh, when in doubt, give it to he did that quite a bit. Uh, so it's going to be significant. They're going to need guys like Lab McConkey, guys like Ra Ra Thomas, Dominic Lovett to step up without him. Uh, you look at Georgia and consider the fact they're 7 and 0, uh, but given you lose Brock Bowers, there's a lot of questions that uh, I and everyone else watching this game is going to have about Georgia when they take the field on Saturday. Yeah, Billy Napier went so far as to call him one of the best players of all time. Meanwhile, Napier will be looking for a few gems of his own. Florida, the home team in this game, so they get to host prospects. The Gators 2024 recruiting class currently ranks third nationally with 2022 with 22 commits. Jacob, what kind of impact does this game and its result have on recruiting? Yeah, certainly a unique set of circumstances when it comes to recruiting. This is a neutral site game, so Florida is not allowed to have any direct contact with recruits. But as Billy Napier told us earlier this week, there's still a great deal of benefit that can come from this contest. Getting prospects out and being able to see the team perform against high level competition is not an opportunity that they want to let go to waste. And they are not. There are going to be plenty of star studded players uh, at you know the contest in Jacksonville. Alabama four star defensive back commit Jameer Grimsley is among those who are you know expected to be in attendance. Uh, 2025 five-star Solomon Thomas, also among those uh, who are expected to be at the game. And this is an opportunity for Florida to impress them, maybe try uh, and show that they're ahead of schedule in terms of their development as a team. Uh, obviously, Georgia is no joke, having won 24 straight games coming into this contest and ranking as the number one team in the nation. Uh, a competitive contest could go a long way for Florida, and they're trying to kind of show kids that, you know, they need them to be a part of it if they want uh, to be successful and if they want to compete in these kinds of matchups. And, and Florida is not going to let that opportunity go to waste. They are going to have lots of players in attendance uh, just, you know, in an attempt to show them what Florida is made of and, and uh, hopefully, you know, get them back into Gainesville later on in the season uh, and, and, you know, opportunities to be able to make contact in person, which, again, they can't do uh, in Jacksonville. But just to get them in front of the game, I think Florida feels is important. Now, for Carson Beck, this is a return to his hometown of Jacksonville. And, Jordan, you kind of mentioned Brock Bowers has worked as kind of a security blanket for him. His efficiency rating almost 50 points higher this season when he's targeting Bowers. So how do you expect him to perform in this game without him? 
Well, it's going to be really interesting, and I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on Carson, which it's funny talking to some of his teammates this week. They said they haven't seen anything different from Carson. He's been noted for being really low-key, you know, even level-headed, uh, even in tough situations, and you've seen that with how he's played. you got to imagine this game means a lot to him to be back in Jacksonville. was a standout at Mandarin High School, won a state championship while he was there. Uh, it will be really fascinating to see how he plays this game. To his credit, he has done a good job of not really just relying on one receiver this year. There's been multiple games where they've had eight, nine, ten different receivers catch passes in games, including the tight ends and the running backs. Uh, so really fascinating to see what he does in this game. And it's kind of interesting, too. A lot of people don't realize that once upon a time, Carson Beck was bound for Florida, but in baseball. Early in his high school career, he was a baseball commit to the Gators. Decided football was going to be his sport. Uh, was at one point an Alabama commit. Winds up coming to Georgia. The rest is sort of history there. So this game certainly is going to mean a lot to Carson, and uh, I believe he will step up to the challenge. Yeah, I think Jordan brings up something really interesting there, and that's the depth of the amount of options that Carson Beck has to go to. Uh, without Brock Bowers in the fold. And that's something that Billy Napier brought up this week as well. You know, there is no shortage of skill position players at Georgia's disposal, even without their superstar tight end. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on this Florida defense, which hasn't exactly looked so good in recent weeks, especially on the road. Uh, at home, Florida has been great. 18.7 points allowed per game. On the road or in neutral site games, though, that number inflates to over 30. And so... This is a Florida defense that will need to prove it can be better in terms of its tackling. It's going up against a Georgia offensive line that has allowed just one quarterback pressure as a result of its own bad blocking so far this season, which is a tremendous number in seven total games. Uh, Florida's defensive line has not put consistent pressure on quarterbacks, and this will not be the game to not be able to do that. Georgia is an excellent offensive team. Uh, it, you know, their defense has kind of been their calling card over the last several seasons, but the offense is nothing to scoff at either. Uh, and we will need to see Florida be better at its tackling and, and keeping teams out of the end zone, maintaining pressure and continuing its success on third down will be huge in this contest if it wants to get out of there with a win. All right, we'll talk about the quarterback on the other side. Graham Mertz, all of his numbers looking efficient, his completion rate of 76 percent, one of the best in the nation. But Jacob, last time you were here talking about Florida, you pointed out how the reason why that completion rate is so high is because all of, most of his passes are coming within 10 yards. However, we know Georgia's not great at defending crossing routes. So how do you expect Mertz to match up against Georgia? Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of the same trend in terms of Mertz maintaining a high completion percentage within that short to intermediate range. But for the most part, through seven weeks, it's been working. Florida is 5-2. and two. It's coming off a 41-point offensive performance at South Carolina, which was really impressive. Mertz has been kind of the head of that operation. He has facilitated for Florida in a way that it needed him to be able to do. And the results have been very good. Uh, in this game, however, I think the key will be whether or not Florida is able to keep him clean and whether or not Mertz is able to get the ball out of his hands in a timely manner. This is a Georgia defense that might not get the most amount of sacks. The number in that category specifically is down relative to recent years, but they still do what Kirby Smart calls create havoc. They get into the backfield. Uh, they are able to disrupt plays. They maintain a very low completion percentage against, I believe it's below 55% against FBS opponents. Uh, and Graham Mertz will have to be able to kind of control that. Do not let the pressure get to him. He'll have to find his options and distribute. Guys like Eugene Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Florida's running backs even will be critical uh, in this contest and, and being able to facilitate to those guys without, you know, allowing the pressure of Georgia's excellent defense to get to you uh, is, is the entire key to the game, in my opinion. Jacob hit on a lot when it comes to the Georgia defense, and I think that they take it personally that some people think that this defense isn't quite as good as it has been in years past. Having said that, they've done a very good job in defending the pass, and you know, talking to Kamari Lassner, Jamon Dumas Johnson, some of the guys on this defense, they really respect Florida's offense. They understand how effective Graham Mertz has been. Uh, it was Javon Bullard and Kamari Lassner both pointed out his completion percentage. They understand that if they give him a lot of time, if they let guys get open, he's going to find them and uh, I think they understand that they've got to be on their P's and Q's I think that the pressure's on this defensive line 
Uh, as Jacob mentioned, this is not a defense that creates a lot of sacks. Uh, generally has done a pretty good job of pressuring, but it seems like they're always a second or two away from the sacks. Uh, they have to affect Graham Mertz. I, I've been really impressed with how he's played. Uh, the poise he showed in the fourth quarter of that game against South Carolina, very impressive. Uh, it's on Georgia to get him uncomfortable, to make him make mistakes. He doesn't do that very often. Uh, I'm expecting this to be a four-quarter game in Jacksonville, and it's on the Georgia defense to cause some issues and uh, maybe create a turnover or two to get Mertz off his rhythm. Hey, four-quarter game sounds good to me. All right, Jordan, if you could pick one key to a win, what would it be? I think the biggest thing for Georgia is just establishing the run early. We've seen that Florida is susceptible to giving up a lot of runs. Uh, that Kentucky game giving up 329 rushing yards. Uh, there's going to be pressure on Carson Beck without Brock Bowers, but you've got a, a capable run game. Dejan Edwards has been very good as the lead back. Georgia needs some other guys to step up behind him. They've just been very banged up at the running back room, uh, but they're very capable of getting the ball rolling. I think if you do that, you alleviate some of the pressure on Carson Beck, who, again, has done a very good job of handling big situations, but you know there's got to be uh, sort of those butterflies in the stomach knowing he's back in his hometown playing Florida. I think if you're able to establish a run, kind of keep Florida on its heels, it's going to open up opportunities for Carson down the field and can set the stage for Georgia to get the ball rolling on offense. And I've said this before here, I'm going to go back to the well one more time. The key to the game for Florida, in my mind, is whether or not it can distribute the ball to Eugene Wilson, the superstar freshman wide receiver, speedy player, former four-star prospect. Uh, you know, it has those NFL bloodlines, and he has been absolutely crucial when healthy for the Gators so far this season. Over 250 receiving yards, he's found the end zone, but the ways in which Florida is able to utilize him have been very interesting. He aligns in the backfield sometimes to give linebackers a different look against a very solid and speedy route runner. Florida's able to get him open in space. He had a key catch against South Carolina uh, that allowed Florida to secure a late victory after Ricky Pearsall couldn't hold on to the ball. And, and this is a Georgia team that is going to have to try and contain a guy who really hasn't been contained by any of his opponents so far this season. Whether or not Florida can distribute to him with volume, I think, uh, will be something that will allow its offense to really get going, to distract the Georgia defense in a way, and, and to open up other options around the field. All right, Jordan and Jacob, thanks so much, and enjoy the cocktail party. And for more on the game, check out Swamp 24-7 and Dogs247.com, keeping you up to date on all your Florida and Georgia football and recruiting news all year long. <laughs>